Joining me are two special guests. Roger Robinson is an author, he's a professor, a sports historian, and he's a writer, and he's a former world-class runner. And we also have Catherine Switzer, who's an author of Marathon Woman and many other books they're both known for. And she's the first woman to officially register for the Boston Marathon, and I'm delighted to have them both on the show. And welcome to the show, and welcome back to Vancouver. Thank you, it's wonderful to see you again. And yes. we, love, we love Vancouver, we've been here often together. We, we should, one thing you didn't say is that we are actually married, which is why we, we are <laughs> operating together. And, and now it's on here. Uh, and Vancouver was one of the first places we came to, in fact. Well, welcome. Yeah. And so you're both here today to talk about, well, running, of course, and congratulations on the release of your new book called When <clears throat> Running Made History. So tell us, when did this all begin? Well, people say, how, do, how long did it take you <coughs> to write the book? And I say, well, about 70 years, <laughs> because it's a, it's a lifetime experience. It really began with the idea that nobody has written the history of the modern running movement. They've written histories of running, going back to ancient Greece, etc. But the modern running movement is so important in society uh, that I felt somebody should write a history of it. But as I got into it, I realized that um, it was more than just a history of running, because to put it this way around, could you imagine writing a history of New York or of Boston or of London or even of Vancouver without referring to its marathon? Because those events have such an impact. And I realized that running is actually more important than just something that happens on the back pages of the newspaper. And then the other dimension as I began to write this was that I realized I was drawing on my own experience so much. And in a way that was getting in the way of, of the history of, of being, as it were, an objective historian. And I thought, well, I'd better be upfront about this and write about the history that I have witnessed or been part of, which I've been fortunate, or in some cases, not so fortunate, to be right there on the spot. You know, nobody really wanted to be in New York on 9-11, and nobody really wanted to be in Boston at the time of the bombings, but I was. And I saw what happened with running and how important it was in helping with the world to recover from those things. So I decided I'll be quite upfront about this is my personal experience. I'm not writing about things that I wasn't present at, I'm writing about those. And through that, I've managed to, as it were, lay the groundwork for, for a full history. Um, like an observer, right? Yes, it's not, I see the book as not being about me, it's about me as observer, so exactly that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when was the moment you said, I want to write the book? Was it in, when you ran the Berlin Marathon? That, that actually was, was a seed for it because um, Catherine and I were invited to Berlin in 1990. She's an old friend of Horst Milder, uh, who was the race director. His son, Mark Milder, is now the race director. And they invited us there. Neither of us was really fit, but, but, but we were up front. We, we told you about that. But it was going to be so important to see a marathon go through both parts of Berlin for the first time since wow. World War II. And in our different ways, we had both been very affected by Germany. I was in England, just outside London, in the, in the war. And so my first memories were of, of bombs and then, and then flying bombs dropping on houses in our street. Catherine was actually born in Germany because her father was in the US Army. And so we both had these strong connections with Germany. We wanted to see this sort of absolute, you know, epic moment in history of when Germany was being reunited. And what I say in that chapter, and this is absolutely true observation, is that the best celebration of that reunification was the marathon. The celebration itself, you know, they had fireworks and they had speeches and they had Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and all of that, but the German people were a bit kind of guarded. They didn't want to get too carried away by jubilation. And I say in the book, they know what mass jubilation can lead to, so they're a bit cautious about it. But the marathon runners let it all hang out. And, and, and as I said, I've never been kissed by so, so many soggy bearded Europeans <laughs> <laughs> as, as, we, as when we were going through the Brandenburg Gate. And it was a fabulous experience. And, yes. And it, it expressed freedom. It expressed the, word, the world's jubilation that this was an important step forward in freedom. Right. And you know what? We talked at the top of the, st uh, st uh, the show, I should say, about how did you two meet? <laughs> 
How did it happen? <laughs> well, it was really interesting. We actually met on the speaking stage uh, at the 1983 Canberra Marathon in Australia. And um, so we, didn't, we weren't actually running together, and I had heard about him as a speaker. But once he started to speak, of course, with that beautiful voice and a wonderful storytelling ability, I fell in love at first voice. Some people fall in love at first sight. I fell in love at first voice. And hey, Roger, how did well, you... Well, <laughs> we had actually, had actually met, sort of met, or I'd seen her three years before because I was in London doing academic research and I read there was going to be a women's marathon in London, so I went out to watch it, combined it with my Sunday run. And before the, the women themselves came by, uh, this big London bus came by with the officials on it, and included in those, and I say in the book, I'm prepared to swear that, that now that, that I actually saw Catherine Switzer on the top of this big open top double-decker bus, because she was the race director of that race. And that's in a way typical of what I was saying about how this was my eyewitness. So my contact with women's running started at that moment, or at least my close-up of, of modern women's running started at that moment, though I'd actually always mixed with women runners quite naturally in England and New Zealand. Uh, and then, of course, when Catherine and I in 1983 actually met and then very soon afterwards got together and, and married, I've been able to observe women's movement from close up through that quite privileged position. And one of the challenges of the book was, was writing about women's running using that inside information, but without being biased. You know, without everybody saying, oh, of course, you're married to Catherine Switzer, yeah, yeah. Um, and getting what I'm actually quite pleased with as mm -hmm. one of the best objective accounts of Catherine's career and what she contributed to women's running. Uh, not in a biased way, but really getting it in a different perspective. But, but creating an incredibly good and a historically important chapter on women's running, totally outside of me, about the history of women's running. Roger yes. goes back and he has, in the book, one of the best chronologies, one of the best timelines of women's running in the back yes. of the book. Yeah, that's, it's, 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 really it's not a, a history of running, but that's one of the things that's wrapped within the book. Right. I mean, that's a history of the modern running boom, history of women's running, history of masters running. Those, those three things are all in it. And they had, there are timelines that really fill the gaps from my own narrative. I wasn't in Boston when Catherine got attacked by the race director in 1967, yes. so that's not there, other than just as a, as a passing reference. But I was in London and saw that Avon Marathon that was the race that persuaded the Olympic Committee to include the Women's Marathon in the Olympics. So it was historically really important. And the most televised? Yes. Yes, amazing. All of that. Amazing. Yes, right. Yeah, so that was So it was an important race. <laughs> Well, it was interesting to have so many different television networks there. Um, and, and then we had fuel to also present to the International Olympic Committee in terms of the representation of the countries uh, and the performances. We needed 24 countries and three continents, and we had 27 countries and five continents. So it was really important. And in 1984, yes. I saw the first woman, American woman, um, Jean 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 Bernard, Jean Bernard coming Sanderson. down with her cap down. And I remember that. And you were part of that. You were an important part. So I was, and in fact, I was on the commentary team uh, as well as, as helping to make the event itself happen. And, and I thought, of course, at the time, that this, this is the best part of my career. I'm never going to do more than this. And who would have ever imagined that all these years later, the women's movement continues in such a big way and through running. So I tell us, right, I'm, I'm not telling Joan Benoit, Greta Weitz, you know, that, that's not the story. I'm, I'm telling how important women's running has become in giving women a place in the community. And one key thing, as well as that London race, another one that I choose is the 1981 New York City Marathon, mm -hmm. where I was actually, I wasn't there in New York, I was doing television commentary in New Zealand, so I was involved in that way, and this is me as TV commentator. But that was the race that had more women than any race had ever had before. It was won by Alison Rowe, who was this kind of compelling figure, and of course, great for us as, as, as doing the New Zealand commentary. And I say that there, women were being applauded by other women for perhaps the first time in history, mm -hmm. outside, you know, just a few people running 100 meters in the Olympic game. They're out on the streets, and women in their thousands are out on the streets. And I quote a London journalist re reporting the race, and he said the crowd reception rose to, I think, became berserk, I think is the word he <laughs> used, every time a woman runner came by. So that's a really important point, not just in running history or sports history, but social history. Mm -hmm. Women are out there, not necessarily being as big and strong and beautiful as Alice and Rowe, but just out there cranking it out and doing it and being applauded for trying. Yes. And, it, and you know, your book is based on 21 events. Yes. 
and understand that um, women, uh, there's a chapter on women's room from 1896 to 27, there's a running boom, right? That, that covers, that cover, yeah, yes, I, for women's right. running I go back a bit because yes. there's a lot of dispute about what mm. happened in 1896 and I want to try and clarify that, but the main emphasis is, is the running boom time, 19, 1970s and 80s. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And what other important, I mean, there was the Ben Johnson you wrote about yeah. the chapter. Reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> Reluctantly. Well, well, one that links with, with Vancouver, Christine, is I give one chapter, and of course I'm, you know, I live in New, I've lived in New Zealand for 50 years, and, I'm, I'm, and I love that country. Uh, and I was the stadium announcer at the Commonwealth Games in 1974. Mm -hmm. And what I saw happen in Little Christchurch, New Zealand, was that putting on those games enabled Christchurch and New Zealand as a whole in a way to redefine themselves and give themselves a place in the world and, and Vancouver had done that in 1954 and Jason Beck's book The Miracle Mile about yes. the Vancouver says exactly that he said that time Vancouver defined itself as a multicultural place for the first time in history and a, pl a city that had a place in the world instead of being right on the edge of the edge, you know, which it had always been before. And I realized, having read Jason's book and thinking about Christchurch, realized that the same process was happening there. So for, for the community, for the, play the thing that running does for a whole community, that's an yes. important chapter, and it links with what happened in Vancouver at that time. And it's basically, it's not a, a book on history of running, right? It's, it's about running is more than a sport. Yes. Another chapter, for instance, and this is something that mean, means a lot to me, is I see running as a leader in the environmental movement, mm -hmm. and I think it could be more of a leader. It's got a lot of money, a lot of lobbying power, and I'd like to see us doing more even than we are now in terms of making a contribution to the places that we run in. Mm -hmm. You know, we go out and, and you know we ran some beautiful trails this this morning in, here in Vancouver, in a nice wooded wooded area. Well, does the sport of running actually help to pay for that? Does it invest in? I don't know, but I think it should, and I think we should be doing more to develop those areas, to develop running trails, and to put back into the places where we run. And in that way, running has made history because I quoted a whole lot of races. You know, where running does contribute to the environment, and the, the argument is, I think running can do more. Yes, and. Is that your favorite part of the book? In the book, uh, <laughs> or no, no. I think I, I really have two favorite parts. Um, one, I'm old, and therefore it's great to look back on your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and so, writing about what I saw when I was age nine, when I saw Abel Zatopek, that has a real appeal. Yeah. The other is, you know, I'm a runner, and so the race I like talking about most is the one I won. You know, and so at the end of the book, you know, I describe my race against Jim McNamara when we were racing for the over 50 championship. This is in the chapter about masters running and running for older people and how you can keep competing. And we had these two absolutely great races against each other. And the first one I won, so I focus on that, of course, because you know, all runners like talking about that one. Yes. <laughs> and that, that was my favorite book because I beat Jim. My favorite bit in the book. <laughs> But, you know, running is, like I said, running is more than a sport, but it's, um, it's about um, getting people inspired to run. And here comes the 261 Fearless Movement. Let's, Catherine, tell us. Well, who would have imagined, this is my old bib number from the Boston Marathon in 1967 that the official tried to rip off of me and throw me out of the race. He, he didn't succeed, but he got the corner, as you can tell. <laughs> my boyfriend decked the official and I went on to finish. But what's happened is, oddly enough, in the 51 years since then, is this, the number has become sort of a cult number, meaning fearless in the face of adversity. And from that, we've created a nonprofit uh, organization and movement mm -hmm. around the world where we are creating community clubs um, and pushing this movement so that women themselves can feel as fearless as we have felt from, from our running, that, that we want to take this sense of fearlessness around the world to them and empower them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, running's become a social revolution in North America. And it's not about getting fast or being competitive or making the Olympic team, it's about feeling good and full of self-esteem and control of your own body. And um, when we take that movement around the world, we're gonna change the world. Running has changed the world already with women. It's gonna continue to do it. And we hope to do that with 261 Fearless and invite yes. everybody to join us at 261fearless.org. Become a friend or run with us. Be great. Yes. Start a club right um, here in Vancouver. <laughs> and, and, and my contribution to a, to a running movement is to encourage older people to keep running or to start running. There's no reason why, why you shouldn't. And even older people who may have 
some kind of disability or problem. And so my running club is organized by two people called Mark and Russell, oh, yes. who I introduced to you. Uh, this is <laughs> Russell, he's older, he's, um, he's seven years old and he's a partial knee replacement. And after him, I, I was running well enough to be winning my age group, the, the over 70 age group, quite often, and, and running 22 minutes for 5K. And then, um, unfortunately, the other knee went, and so he was replaced, fully replaced by Mark. And Mark is now running, and he's down to 30 minutes for 5K. He does a lifetime best. He's almost, almost a year old. And it is possible, and I've worked with, the, the surgeons are called Russell and Mark, so the knees are named after the surgeons who implanted them. And the surgeons are fascinated with this process and with the proof that it may be offering that it is perfectly possible to get back to running on a knee replacement and that you may in fact not loosen the prosthesis but strengthen it by doing it. It's not certain yet, but so far the evidence is looking promising. No wear and tear, no damage. The bottom line is this, and everybody should take this message, is that as you age, the most important thing you can do is stay active. Yes, we have the stats right. now to show that you live longer, you live better, you have better optimism. And um, where can people get your book? It's selling in, in Vancouver in Peter Butler's Four Runners stores. Yes. Um, and it's also available on Amazon or it's available from the publisher Syracuse University Press in America but there is a, uh, is a Canada distributor probably best to go through through Peter Butler's forerunner stores in Vancouver I think yes. and that'll encourage him to restock after after he's sold <laughs> 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 but it's going it's going it's going well people that's are beginning awesome. to talk about it and like it and the reviews so far have been wonderful that's that's yeah. wonderful and Catherine you have your marathon woman well this is actually the last edition we have a new one since hit then but Marathon Woman is 10 years old already um, it's still selling fabulously I love this book everybody does I'm working on a new one but you can get it on Amazon or order it from your local bookstore no problem it's wonderful you okay. too thank you both for coming on the show well, thank you Christine Thanks for watching. If you have a question or comment about today's show, go to our website on the screen. For past episodes of the show, go to our YouTube channel. Until next time, run with it. Run With It is sponsored by BC Sports Hall of Fame, Hype Hair, Mallory's Fashion Network, and Skechers Performance Canada.